Now let's take our Bibles and we will turn back to the book of Exodus, chapter 7 tonight. You know, when you're dealing with um, the Word of God, so many times the more you dig into it and uh, you like to give a survey to your people and not bog them down on details, but there's so many things that are so fascinating in the Word of God that are interconnected. And we'll see that tonight. How many of these plagues uh, are repeated in the book of Revelation, as well as just uh, that we realize that these plagues were much more significant than just that God pronounced a, a curse upon Egypt or whatever, but each one of them had some very deep political and theological uh, implications. And so we see and now in chapter uh, 7, and we know that the first part of chapter 7, uh, Moses uh, was complaining to God. God reiterated to him that uh, exactly what he wanted to Moses, what he wanted Aaron and him uh, himself to do, or for Moses to do. And so we see now that they had gone, uh, and we, and then God gives us a time stamp, or at least tells us how old they were. Moses in verse uh, uh, seven is eighty years old, and Aaron is eighty-three. And so it tells us uh, now, can you imagine that? They're just getting started in their ministry at 83 and 80. Uh, that uh, gives us all a little bit of hope, doesn't it? But here we see that uh, that God was ready to use them. And then the Lord spoke to Moses as we look in verse um, 8. Uh, and spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you, uh, saying, show a, mir a miracle to your, uh, for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take a rod. Now what he's doing, he said, that Mo Moses, Aaron, uh, Pharaoh is going to challenge you. And we know the first three miracles, uh, the Pharaoh thinks that he has a, uh, the first three plagues anyway, the, there's actually 12 miracles beginning with this one and then the Red Sea crossing between this chapter and ver chapter 14 or chapter 15 anyway. And so there's 12 on uh, each one on each side of that, those 10 plagues. And so we see that, uh, uh, the first one was where we see that, uh, the Lord told them about the snake or the, um, the asp. And so we see that, um, so Moses in verse 10, so Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants. Now, who were the servants and how many were there? Who were these two magicians that uh, could duplicate something that Aaron did with the, or with the rod? We know their names are Janus and Jambres. Because for whatever reason, the Lord told us who it was uh, through Paul, through the inspiration of Paul that God gave uh, through Paul uh, in chapter 3 of Second Timothy. And so we see that and it, it, it deals with the last times. And uh, we'll see that these plagues are going to deal and going to be repeated in the last times. But in chapter 3 of first or Second Timothy, it says now, uh, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, blasphemers, um, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without con self-control, brutal, uh, despisers of good, traitors, heady, high-minded, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lo lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Now, boy, that sounds like a bunch of good people, doesn't it? I mean, he just rattles off a lot of things that's going to be in the last times, and that's where we are today. It says, and from such people turn away. So that is not the people that uh, the church and Peter and others are to gravitate toward. Now, we want to save, we'll get them saved, but those are not the people that we have, as we said this morning, Cornelia. We don't have a lot in common with those people, I hope. Uh, the more common the church has with people like that, the less effectiveness the church has. So now notice it goes on in verse uh, 6. For in this sort uh, are those who creep into houses and make captive of gullible women and loaded uh, down with sins, uh, led away by various lusts, uh, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So they, these people are great deceivers, and they get people playing on their emotions and all the rest. 
But he says, now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds disapproving or disapproved uh, concerning the faith, but they will progress no further for their folly was as to all as theirs, Janus and Jambres, also was. And so we see that uh, that Paul, that the Holy Spirit gave him, and we don't know exactly how, uh, if it was through human element or whatever, but we see that Janus and Jambres were these two men that uh, brought their snakes in, and then they were the magicians for the first three plagues that uh, they tried to duplicate what uh, the Lord did. And... Uh, and Pharaoh thought he had a fall guy or that, uh, you know, he could, that his gods were as strong as his. But every one of these plagues now are going to be a direct attack on Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. And so we see now that, um, that we know what happened, how that, uh, Pharaoh threw down, uh, or that the Janus and Jambres let their snakes go and, um, and that rod of, uh, Aaron's was, it's interesting, we'll see the rods of Aaron in the first uh, several of the uh, plagues, but then we're going to see Moses is taken over. Same way we see that Aaron speaks very beginning, at the very beginning, and God puts the, the uh, tells Moses to tell Aaron exactly what to say, and they do exactly what God tells them to do. But later on, we'll see that Moses is the one who just starts defying Pharaoh and, and, and telling him what God's going to do. And so we see that uh, it's interesting, that transformation, just like with Peter, as we see that he went from uh, uh, a bumbling, hurt man who uh, just was bitter of soul because of his failures, to a man who boldly preached the gospel in one of the greatest messages ever preached on the earth uh, in Acts chapter 2. And we see that Moses is going to become that man. And and by Deuteronomy, he the, the masterpiece of, of the love that he shows to that new generation of people and the outpouring of his heart. And he keeps telling, follow the Lord, follow the Lord. And he talks to them and reasons with them. Uh, and it's him speaking. Moses are, or Aaron is already dead by that time. So it's interesting to how that the growth of these men are so evident in in the Bible, and what a what a blessing it is just to trace their their walk with God, and how that God took them from nobodies and made them somebodies when they realized they were nobodies, and so their strength was made perfect in God's weakness, and so we see now that uh, that those happened. Now we so we see in verse fourteen. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. Notice again, we see that uh, there's that interplay between the Lord uh, working in Pharaoh and Pharaoh working in Pharaoh as far as the hardening of the heart. Ten different times we see God hardens heart. Ten different times we see that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So which one was it? Uh, all, all I can say is if you harden your heart, God can still use you. And he can harden your heart to do something you wouldn't want to do. And so there again, we see that... Uh, so. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, uh, uh, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. Now, this is probably a ceremonial time that uh, Pharaoh is going out with his entourage and whatever they're doing. The, the, one of the gods of Egypt was the river god. And so um, they would go out and do whatever they would do with uh, with their emblems and so forth. And uh, Pharaoh, of course, being one of the gods of Egypt, uh, this would be a, one of the ways that the mystique would go on about him being a quasi-god among the people. And so um, and they said, go out to meet him. And the rod which, was t- uh, turn, uh, which turned a serpent, you shall take in your hand, and you shall say to him, the Lord God, Jehovah, Elohim, um, the Lord God of the uh, Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. And so you just didn't walk up and uh, wake up and walk up to a Pharaoh and interrupt his ceremony and say that unless you have the protection of God. And so this is something, if he's upsetting the entourage here, if he's upsetting the little uh, whatever that Pharaoh did, uh, going down and having his little worship service, uh, 
then uh, he would be considered an activist today, I guess. But uh, here we see that Moses was able to do it. And uh, contrary to activism in the United States, uh, people didn't have the right to be activists there, and he would have probably been uh, killed on the spot uh, if it wasn't for God. But this, was t- this took a lot of boldness for Aaron and Moses to do, but God told them to do it, and they are gaining their trust in God that when God says do something, then they would have his protection. Notice God already tells them what's going to happen. And so we see that he says, But indeed until now you shall not, uh, would not uh, uh, hear. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord, that I am Jehovah. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river, and with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood, and the fish and uh, that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. And then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, notice how it's going uh, from uh, the, the path here, the Lord to Moses to Aaron, uh, which will soon uh, change. But the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, uh, Take your rod and stretch over uh, out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams, over their rivers and the ponds, and over the, the pools of water, and they shall become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and uh, pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded. Notice they are very... Uh, uh, obedient, they are specific in being obedient to the Lord. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters, and there was in the river, in the, uh, uh, that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his serpents, uh, servants, and the water that, uh, were in the, the waters that were in the river were turned to blood, the fish that were in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river, so there was blood throughout all of Egypt. And then the, mag- the magicians of, uh, of Egypt did so with their enchantments. Now, how they did it and what scale they did it must have been minuscule, but at the same time, they could say, hey, we can do that too. And so it was a situation where they're saying, you know, well, these guys are doing something, but... Uh, you know, Pharaoh's God, and we can we can show that our gods are strong, and so they uh, they did it with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Notice his heart grew hard, not the Lord hardened his heart, and he did not heed them. And the Lord said, uh, as the Lord said to Pharaoh, um, and Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water uh, to drink because they could not drink the water that was uh, the, of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. Now, how would you like to have a, a week of uh, blood for water? You turn on your tap water and yuck. Uh, do you, every once in a while, do you get those little uh, uh, notices saying, don't drink the water because we've broken a pipeline? Uh, that's always bad. Uh, we had that happen several times in, in Michigan. And nothing like washing your clothes and all of a sudden there's sand all in your clothes. <laughs> but you can imagine if it was blood. So well, what a mess this was going to be. And then just being able to drink would be, be absolutely horrible. But we know um, if uh, as you uh, turn over to um, the book of Revelation, if you would please, and um, we'll just look and see the beginning of this, and actually it's going to go um, for quite a while. In fact, the chapter 16 is where we're going to, so just keep your finger once we look at the Revelation um, 7 and 8, or excuse me, in chapter 8, verses, verses 7 and 8, um, and then we'll turn over to chapter 16 and pick up most of the rest of these. But in Revelation uh, chapter 8, we know the plagues that are happening and, um, excuse me, um, and we see in verses 7 and 8 that uh, it says, Then the first angel sounded, and, whoops, let's see, hail, and, and fire followed, we know that's one of the plagues, um, mingled with blood, 
and that were thrown on the earth, and the third of the trees were burned up, and uh, all the green grass. And then the second angel sounded something like a, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown to the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were. So notice the sea becomes blood. Now, exactly what that means has been debated. Well, God, we know that one thing that happens, especially in battles, is if there's a lot of men that die along the river banks or in the river, actually, literally, rivers can turn to turn red from the blood of uh, of soldiers who have died or people who have uh, died close to a river. Does that mean the water was mi- mixed with blood, or does it mean that the water actually became blood? Well, um, I. But the way the Lord says, you know, that the river turned to blood. So whatever, you say, well, that couldn't happen. Well, uh, this is where the miracle comes in. Um, God can do anything he wants to. <laughs> so did it turn to blood? As far as I know, it did. It Was it mingled with water? I don't know. But the thing about it, it was so bad that it stunk and it killed the fish. So that's pretty thick blood or th- pretty thick uh, ratio of blood and water, even if it was, wasn't it? It killed, and the fish stunk, and everything else stuck around the river. And this, don't forget now, the Nile was the water source for, for Egypt. If it wasn't for the Nile, there'd be no Egypt. And so they had the river god, and the river god was called, uh, actually, Happy, H-A-P-Y, not two Ps. And uh, this is one of the um, gods of the river, and, uh, of course, of the crocodiles and all the rest and the mystique of the river and, uh, the river would overflow its banks and that, so that it was a uh, part of a god of fertility, but these gods kind of interlapped with one another or overlapped with one another. And so we see that, uh, uh, this one god was, of course, the god who, ra- who, uh, supply. He was a god of supply. He supplied Egypt with its very livelihood. And so the, uh, to have the river done like that, uh, you can imagine the consternation on the people, especially if they go out and say, well, they can't get water out of the river, but the water tables around here is pretty high because of the river. So they go and dig a, a well or something, or a few deep, uh, a few feet down. And even that turned to blood. And so we see, we'll see over in chapter 16 that this happens again, but, uh, and, or happens, uh, with, uh, the judgments that God causes on the, um, on the earth. Now, in saying that, then we see that in uh, chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 8, chapter 8 of Exodus. Now, just keep your finger in Revelation. We'll go back to that, especially chapter 16. Uh, And the Lord spake to Moses uh, and to Aaron and to to say to them, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go, that they serve serve me. But if they refuse to let them go, behold, smite all the territory with frogs. Uh, I think there was an evangelist by the name, I think his name was B.R. Lakin, and he had a message called One More Night with the Frogs. And so uh, this, he took it, uh, his text from this and how that uh, people harden their hearts. And so we see in verse 3, So the river uh, shall bring forth frogs abundantly, and they shall go up and come into your house and into your bedroom and into your bed. How'd you like that, ladies? Wouldn't that be great? That'd be a real froggy situation, wouldn't it? But... Uh, here we see that uh, into the um, uh, houses of the servants of your people, into your ovens, ugh, can you imagine baked, baked frog? Uh, that's a stunt. And into your kneading bowls, here you are uh, making a big old pie, and all of a sudden a frog jumps in. Um, pretty bad stuff. Uh, and then the frogs shall come uh, up on you and your people and all your servants. There again, we get into uh, frogs, and uh, the, uh, actually, they have pictures of frogs, or the 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 uh, the, uh, the ancient Egyptian archaeology, and they're finding that the people actually worship these things, and uh, the the god of the frogs was a guy named or a girl named H uh, E uh, K E T. You uh, so Hecat, whatever. But uh, again. Uh, but this uh, God was, again, whenever you have these gods, uh, they're either, they have something to do with hedonism. And the frogs, of course, um, uh, uh, were a symbol of abundance, but also uh, they were controlled by the crocodiles, 
because the crocodiles, uh, the Egyptian crocodiles loved frogs. And so whatever the musicians did, they, they in order to uh, replicate this, uh, possibly they had a bunch of frogs that they let go, but then uh, they would disappear because the magicians know where the crocodiles were. But uh, in this situation, they were so overwhelmed by the frogs that uh, the magicians actually had, had failed. Now we'll see the, again about what happens with frogs over in the book of Revelation. In verse 5, and so the Lord spake to Moses and say, uh, stretch out your hand with the rod over the streams and over the rivers and over the ponds. Now, they just got through with blood. Now they're having to deal with frogs. Uh, and um, and cause the frogs to come up to the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments. Oh, look, we can do some of this. They probably had some that they let out, or we don't know exactly what they did. And they brought up the frogs on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that uh, uh, he may... Take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let your people go. Here's his first lie. And so he says, so, yeah, so a lot of times people will say anything to get out of trouble. And this is one of the problems that uh, Pharaoh had. And he said, I will let my people go, and they shall sacrifice to Jehovah. So at least he's acknowledging the God of, of Israel now. And Moses said to Pharaoh, except uh, the honor of saying, when I uh, will I intercede for you, for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from your from you and your house, that they may remain in the river only. Now, this kind of fancy language is saying, what are you saying? Accept the honor. In other words, we are not here to make you lose face in front of your people. We are here to deal and tell you that our God means business, but we're not here to embarrass you in front of your people. And so we're glad that you're going to let our people go, and they will go back to the river as our God, and of course the God, Jehovah, has said. So he said, tomorrow, and he will uh, let it be according to your word that, uh, you, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. That's the one thing we want you to know, that you may know that, Pharaoh, uh, we're not trying to embarrass you. We're not trying to uh, put you down in front of your people. We just want you to know who God is. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses and from your servants. And he goes through all that uh, God will take care of it. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses, Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought up against Pharaoh. Now, why did he do that? Why was he so adamant about crying out? Because he had promised Pharaoh that his God can do it. Okay, he's gaining confidence, but yet he is still kind of concerned that God's, you know, is God going to do what he says he's going to do? And of course God does. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses. Hey, Moses, I'll answer your prayer. And so he's, ga he's gaining experience. When God says to do something, you do it. And when God says that, uh, uh, that for you to say something, he'll back you up. And so he's gaining some real good experience here. And so the frogs died out uh, of the houses, of the, on the, in the courtyards, and on, out in the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stunk, or stink. So you can imagine, uh, my wife and I, uh, when we were in Mobile, Alabama, right after we were married, uh, we had a big problem with a uh, culvert that where they had built some houses on the other side of the, the um, road, and it used to be we had a culvert that would water would go back and forth, and we had a low spot on the front of our of the church property, and we lived in the back of the church property. But uh, uh, that, but whenever they built that, then uh, the water, the rains, and those big gully washers would come in. Uh, all the water was forced on our side, and actually the water would come up to the very. In fact, we had it come into the church several times until finally uh, the county did something about it. But we had to petition over and over for them to do it. But I went home one time, and I looked at our mobile home that we had in the back, and we had the light on, and I, looked, I said, I didn't know our mobile home was polka-dotted. It was white. And uh, I looked out, and there were little green frogs all over that. Uh, and then I looked at the church, and they were just covered the wall of the church. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I guess, our frog time. 
But unfortunately, we didn't have to kill them. They went back once the started drying up. But the buzz, the bad thing about it, you had to kind of, how do you like to have to get a broom and sweep them off just so you can get into the house? Yeah. But that was, that was kind of a, a gross time. Remember that, don't you, dear? And so, uh, the, the, she could put up with the frogs. It was those flying cockroaches that got her. But, uh, you know, all kinds of things down there. But, uh, we see that, uh, this was something that, uh, the Lord, I mean, you can imagine how much worse it would have been if they'd gotten into the house, into our ovens, into our microwaves, every place we turned, uh, take a bath and, or a, ba- a shower, and there they are in their shower. Uh, that would have been horrible. But here we see that uh, the Lord has ways of making people miserable to get their attention. And so this is what the Lord is doing with uh, Pharaoh. Now, we notice in the third plague. And so the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out that rod again and uh, strike the dust of the land so that it may become like lice throughout the land of Egypt. So here's another one of those real uncomfortable. uh, We're getting the people's attention. We're going to make the land stink. We're going to cause all kinds of problems with uh, the cooking and just day-to-day life. They're going to, you know, they can't walk anywhere without frogs. And uh, now we're going to now go to the airborne uh, insects and so forth. And so this would be another one of the gods, and this would be a god named Kepri. And of course, uh, the Lord of the Flies and all this that uh, we, that you, uh, that's all uh, derivatives of things that come out of Egypt. And uh, by the way, uh, we'll see that about cows and how they are attacked. Or And what do we still have today? What was the one thing that uh, the children of Israel had problems with, with Aaron, whenever the Lord was up on the mountain? Cows, right? Sacred cows. And so it's interesting how those gods were so uh, so important, even as far back then. Nothing new under the sun. Uh, cows are still very prevalent in the uh, um, and almost deified in Egypt and uh, in um, India today, and so we see that. Uh, but here we we see the lice, and they have come, and we'll see in just a moment, uh, chap- chapter sixteen, just how many of these things are replicated in the book of Revelation sixteen. And so they did so, in verse uh, 30, 17, And Aaron stretched out his hand on the river and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on men. Actually, there were, there's flies, it could be stinging, whatever. But the idea was that uh, it caused a lot of problems upon man and beast. And on all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their uh, enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So now we see the first uh, couple of plagues, and actually the first three with the snake, we, or the, the miracles anyway, the, the magicians could at least fake people out with their, their enchantments. But now the Lord is starting to take over, and old Janice and Jambres has problem, have problems. And so we see, so the lice uh, were on men and beasts, uh, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, of Elohim. We can't, hey, listen, we've gone as far as we can go. And so, uh, but Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. So don't worry, uh, Moses, I'm telling you what I'm going to do ahead of time, or what he's going to do, because I know it. And so we see the third plague, and then the fourth plague, the flies, Again, we see, and the Lord rose up in the morning and to stand before Pharaoh, uh, and uh, thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me, uh, or else I will not um, let, uh, uh, let my people go. Behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants. And again, these are gods of the, of, um, the atmosphere and stuff like that. Um, and again, we have, uh, these overlapping gods and, uh, why pronounce their names if, uh, you know, they're again, they're just the God, the Lord of the flies, the Lord of, 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 uh, the atmosphere, things like this. And so we see then the houses of the Egyptians, uh, became full of swarms of flies. Now, as a housewife, I think I'd get a little tired of that. Frogs one day, flies the next. And so, uh, but he's getting their attention. Uh, and, uh, also in the ground on which uh, they stand. So these flies, uh, and these, this lice, these stinging, uh, in- insects, it was a, it was a mess. And so the Lord said, I will put, set apart the land of Goshen. So now we see on the fourth miracle that, um, that the Lord 
is saying, okay, I'm going to separate these people because in verse 23, I will make a difference between my people and your people. So Pharaoh, now you're going to see that uh, that this just isn't blanket. I, my God can tr- control not only the flies and the lice, but he can he can control where he puts them. And so the really the old noose is tightening around old Pharaoh, and uh, the Lord is just keeping showing him. He says, that not only can I can I do these things, but I can control exactly how I want to do these things. And so uh, we see that uh, uh, the people, the land of Goshen, and we'll see this throughout the rest of them now, is going to be separated from the plagues of Egypt. And tomorrow the, the sign shall be, and the Lord did so, and the thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, um, and the land was corrupted with them. In verse 25, then uh, Pharaoh called Moses, uh, called for Aaron, uh, Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God. And so he's willing to let them go, but God has to work this out because what the Lord is doing, now that Pharaoh is playing into his hand, is saying, I'm not just go out and worship, but you're going to let them go totally out of the land. Now notice Pharaoh's willing to, okay, go worship your God if you're going to take three days out and you know all that. But no, that's not what God ultimately wants. But Pharaoh has to get to the point where he says, get out of here. And so that's one of the reasons for all these plagues. In verse uh, 26 or 28, let's go back to 26. And Moses said, uh, it is not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing uh, the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. We're not, hey, listen, Pharaoh, uh, we wanted to go out earlier just to worship, but now uh, we, we're not going to do that. Uh, the stakes are a little higher. Uh, you need to let our people go unconditionally. Uh, if we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then uh, will they not stone us? For one thing, uh, Pharaoh, your people won't let us go. And if we just decide to drop our brick kilns or our brick making and have the people leave as household servants and go up as shepherds, people hate us as shepherds in the first place. And uh, so the people aren't going to put up with this, uh, Pharaoh. We need a little bit more than just go and worship somewhere because uh, your people, th- they think they're so superior to us anyway. And so in verse 27, uh, we, will, uh, we will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he will command us. So yeah, okay, we'll go up, but we're not going to worship here in the land. So the stakes are a little higher until we see that. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Intercede for me. Hey, pray to your God for me. So <laughs> notice that uh, he's really in a... Um, he's really a mixed up man. Then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you. I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from your servants and from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully. You already lied to us one time. But don't lie again uh, anymore uh, in letting the people go and sacrifice to the Lord. Then Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, uh, from his servants and from his people. No one, uh, Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time, neither would he let his people go. Second lie. So, yeah, it gets pretty rough. Okay, I'll let your people go. Then when the problems are over with, I'm not going to let your people go. How many times does that remind you of people say, Lord, I'll do anything for you. You just get me out of this mess. And God gets them out of the mess and say, who's God? I mean, that was just something I said to, you know, to get out of the mess, the mess I'm in. Uh, I want forgiveness, but I don't want repentance. You know, I'm, I want God to forgive me, even though I'm not going to repent. And so we see that uh, that's just humankind. That's human hearts. And they're very, very deceitful and desperately wicked. And then in verse nine, chapter 9, now we're, at, uh, we're not going to finish up all these, but I'll show you the correlation in just a moment. The fifth plague um, is uh, the livestock. And then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, chapter one, chapter 9, verse 1. Um, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, uh, notice the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim uh, of the Hebrews, 
Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and stand and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field. Now, wait a minute. This is getting a little, we're shepherds. We're despised because we're shepherds. But our God is going to take care of the things that you you're, that you're superior with us. We're going to take care of your livestock, your cattle. And uh, there's so we see that, uh, and he said, Behold, the hand of the Lord will be upon your cattle in the field, and on your horses, on your donkeys and camels and oxen, and even on your sheep, on, on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. Again, uh, hey, our livestock are going to thrive. Yours are going to, yours are going to die. Now, uh, notice the daring. They're going and they're telling Pharaoh and they're talking to him face to face and they're talking uh, like I tell people. Sometimes you have to talk hardball to people. You have to play hardball. And they're, they're now gaining enough confidence that they're playing uh, hardball with the most powerful men in the world. They're telling them what's going to happen with their God. And they're so confident in their Lord that they, don't, they know they're not going to be hurt by Pharaoh. I mean, that it's one thing to... to um, to read this is another thing to stand before a man with all of his trappings of power around him and say, thus saith the Lord. But you'll see prophets do that throughout Scripture. And so we see that, uh, so nothing shall die of all the, the, that of the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed uh, at a set time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in your land. And so the Lord did this thing in the next day and the livestock of uh, of Egypt died. Of Egypt died, but the livestock of the children of Israel, uh, not one died. Then Pharaoh. Now, what would happen here? The, this was a god which was one of the major uh, gods of Egypt, and this was Apis, and uh, other times it's called Isis. But uh, it's uh, the god that uh, just seemed uh, just to seem to permeate that, the Middle East at the time. If you remember. The Canaanites, they worshipped God, the gods of cattle. Uh, Molech was a, uh, was a cow that they would, would uh, set up on her haunches, a brazen cow. And they would actually uh, take, uh, they would heat that cow up to, or that, uh, that statue up to white hot. And mothers would come and sacrifice their babies on that cow's front legs and just fry it, literally fry it to death. And... Uh, it's almost as bad as abortion, isn't it? But here we see all the things that they would do, all in the name of false gods. And so we see how horrible this was that was going on. Now, what would happen here, though? There, the they they weren't they they killed they they ate their cattle. So there wasn't just every cow like it is in Egypt or in uh, India today or whatever. But they always looked for a special cow that had a certain marking on its on its head. And what this was uh, on its uh, forehead, and it was like almost like a little star, and that would be the sacred cow. But each one of them, actually, whenever Apis or whenever the that uh, that uh, bull would die, it was a symbol of strength, it was a symbol of God, whatever. Then they would have a actually a time of mourning for that cow to that until they found the next one, and this was the idea of uh, of. Regeneration, or of course, of uh, of uh, then they would reinstall the next next bull, and that would be the god of Egypt for a while. Well, and notice how close it's getting to the point of the firstborn, where uh, Egypt, where um, Pharaoh was god, and that son that came after him was the son of God. And of course, then they'd build a big pyramid and make, and, and, uh, and then all the pharaohs who were gods would meet back together in the, the promised land or the happy hunting grounds or whatever. Uh, and, uh, so really that pharaoh was God. And when Egypt was created, it was created with, with, uh, pharaoh as God. And so it just gets into a complicated mess there. But, uh, the Lord is attacking now, uh, and getting closer and closer to the, to that firstborn that's going to really break uh, Pharaoh's heart and his will. 
But we see now that uh, that happened. Now, uh, just in saying, we know that there's a plague of hail that comes up in chapter uh, and verse 13 of chapter nine. And uh, we know that uh, it uh, it really uh, destroyed a lot of the crops and everything else. Well, let's turn over then and look at some of these correlations over in the book of Revelation, and we'll look at chapter seven, uh, 16. There's a lot more, but uh, just so, so for the sake of time, and let's just look at chapter 16, and this is, those la- this is the time of Jacob's trouble. There were other plagues that are very similar to this, but, um, or to the, or that were part of the book of Revelation and uh, are similar to the ones that are in uh, Exodus. But notice in chapter 16, now this is the the final judgments that are coming upon uh, the earth. And so I heard with a loud voice to the temple, the Lord saying to several angels, go and pour out the bowls or the vials of wrath of God on the earth. So the, the first went and pour out his bowl upon the earth and foul and loathsome sword came on the men, um, who had the mark of the beast. And that we haven't gotten to that one yet, but we know that uh, that's one of the plagues, wasn't it? Source that the children of it, that Egypt had. Um, and they they worshipped his image. The second angel, in verse 3, um, poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as a dead man. So now not only the river, but now the, the oceans. And every living creature di- in the sea died. Boy, talk about stink. You ever been around a, a, a fish kill? Or where and they have what's uh, on the Gulf Coast of Alabama. Every, about every few years, they'll have what's called the red tide. And just a bunch of animals come in on a tide, and uh, they die on the beach. And does it stink? And you can imagine what it would be like if it was worldwide. And it became blood as a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Verse 4, And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became, now notice the rivers, they become blood. And as I heard from the angels, notice in verse uh, 8, uh, The fourth angel poured out his bowl uh, on the sun, and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fire and blasphemed the name of the Lord. And then in verse 10, uh, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. That will be one. It was so dark in Egypt that it could be felt. Remember that? And here we see, and of course that is a direct attack on the sun god, Aton. Um, and uh, we see that uh, this was, the, uh, again, something that is replicated in the book of, of Revelation. And then we see in verse 17, uh, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and the loud voice came in the temple of heaven from the throne. It is done. And then they'll go down in verse 20. Uh, Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men. Now, we haven't gotten to that one either, but we know, well, I guess we did with that one. But uh, there again, we know that hailstones, that's one thing that the farmers around there hate to hear about especially about this time of the year when the corn's up and everything, because if they're big enough, it really wrecks the crop. Can you imagine a 90-pound hailstone storm? I mean, would it kind of knock a hole in your roof? Would it kind of hurt your uh, your house? Uh, my, oh, my. And so uh, the, this is what's going to happen. I mean, this makes uh, Egypt look like a child's play that's going to happen in the end time. And so we see that a lot of these things that God used to get a hold of Pharaoh are the same things that God gets a hold of man in the book of Revelation. And just like Pharaoh, because we see that uh, no matter what God does, no matter how God gets their attention and he preaches to them, remember the 144,000 is the only time in Scripture where we see angels actually preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world. God uses man, except in the book of Revelation, where the only time we see angels preaching to man uh, about the Creator and coming to Him. And so, and the everlasting gospel, as it's called, and yet man turns from God. And again, we see that the more that God punishes them, 
the more that they harden their hearts. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? Now, from what I understand, uh, the great experts, I think uh, AOC and a few others, I think it was uh, our, our greatest, one of our great congressmen has given us, uh, what was it, 12 years ago or 12 or 10 years before the world is destroyed by global warming, and now we're down by this time to 8.5 years before uh, the world is destroyed by global warming. Uh, we, you know, it's all this scare tactics. Well, I hope she's right, because if that means that, that means a re- that the Lord Jesus is going to come within the next few months for that to happen by the end of the, the tribulation, right? Because it's going to be seven years. So if she's right, I kind of hope she's a prophet, because I know where I'm going to be. I'm out of here. Amen? You're out of here. We're protected. We won't see any of these plagues, just like the children of Israel did not see the plagues upon Egypt. And so God will bless those who will bless him and leave him. They will escape his wrath to come and even wrath here on earth. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God, isn't it? And so here we see that God is, uh, and we see that God is working so much. He's not only working in Pharaoh's heart, but we'll see later on how that he's working even on the Egyptian hearts. And out of those two million people that left Egypt, there were a lot of Egyptians that went with them. There was a mixed multitude. There were Egyptians that believed in the Lord God of Israel. And we see that they will leave and they will go with Israel. And then we see others that um, that uh, give gifts to Israel just to get out of there. And yet because I think many of them loved the very people that, you know, that... Uh, their God was being per- that uh, Israel's God was uh, a testimony to them, and I think many there will be a lot of Egyptians will be surprised when we get to heaven. How many Egyptians will be in heaven uh, as a result of all these things that are going on? But just like in the end times, we know that uh, there will be a lot of people, no matter how bad it gets here on earth. Those who have not taken of the um, mark of the beast, how many of them are going to be in heaven? But it's interesting how that God uses the book of Exodus to show us the trials that are going to come upon the, 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 men, the people that reject him. But God's good, isn't he? Uh, I have, as the Lord tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, that uh, we have turned to, uh, to God from idols, and now we worship a true and living God, who, and we shall escape the wrath to come. So I'm not worried about the frogs. I'm not worried about the hail. Yes, I'm worried about uh, maybe a little hailstone around here, but I'm not worrying about 90-pound hailstones or anything like that. I'm not worried about the mark of the beast because I know that I'm, I will escape the last wrath to come, and so will you if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. But all oh, the wrath that's going to fall on the man rejects him. Let's pray, Father. We just come to you and we look at all these great miracles and just the astounding things that you can do in the hearts of men and in the lives of men. We thank you, Lord, for the promises that none of these plagues are going to affect us. We know that in this life that we live, we know, Lord, that it's it's rough but nothing compared to what's going to happen with a world that, where your presence is left and you turn it over to Satan for a time of Jacob's trouble, a time of great wrath and destruction, such as the world has never seen. We thank you, Lord, that we are going to escape that and that we're going to be with you forever. Lord, come today. We'd love to see you come. Bless us, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's